Um, so with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Gary Morishima and he will um, provide some background information about this seminar series. So welcome everybody and glad you could join us. Thank you, Marissa. Uh, I'm Gary Morishima, the US section co-chair for the Southern Coho Technical Committee. I'm pleased to welcome you to the inaugural seminar of a series that's really intended to inform the PSC family about how environmental change affects salmon, ecological processes, and fishing. Today's seminar is entitled The New Normal, Heat Waves and Ocean Blobs. What's next? The objective of this series is for speakers from the US and Canada to provide information on important topics to help the PSC family prepare for and contend with increasing uncertainty and the rapid pace of environmental change. The series is a follow-up from a workshop on environmental indicators that was convened last May and is part of the Southern Panel's work plan approved by the Pacific Salmon Commission. We anticipate that these seminars will be held monthly beginning in March. Uh, we plan to establish a steering committee to guide development of the seminar series. And we'd welcome your suggestions for topics and speakers and any volunteers that uh, wish to serve on the steering committee. So please provide any suggestions and contact information to uh, Kim Bartlett of the PSC staff. Uh, as Marissa said, following the completion of the presentations today, we'll have a facilitated Q&A session that John Holmes will uh, handle to help us work through the questions and uh, get into some in-depth discussion. The series is going to be recorded and will be available from the PSC's SharePoint site. So with that brief introduction, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Marissa to introduce our speakers today. So thank you, Gary. So as he mentioned, um, our agenda for today, after the, the introduction and the ground rules, um, our first speaker is going to be Nick Bond. And Nick is um, should be a household name in these parts. He is the Washington State Climatologist, and he's also Affiliate Associate Professor at, at the University of Washington, the College of the Environment where he works on issues related to oceans, climate, ecosystem studies. Um, so Nick's interest is with weather and climate of the North Pacific and Western North America. Uh, he works on causes and effects of climate variation in marine ecosystems and holds a PhD from UW. Now, most of us may know Nick from his work on the warm blob and, and identifying that phenomenon in 2013 and coining the term. Um, and it's uh, his, most of his current research is under the umbrella of the fisheries oceanography coordinated investigations. So with that, I will turn it over to Nick Bond and a reminder to our audience to hold your questions for Nick. Enter them all into the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and then um, we will have this facilitated Q&A in-depth discussion at the end of both presentations. So Nick, if you can share your right. screen. Yeah, thank you. And let's go. So hopefully you can see a Marvelous drawing of a marlin or sailfish in Puget Sound. And let me know if otherwise. Uh, that this thanks to David Horsey, who used to be a, um, a political um, cartoonist for the PI, went to LA and is back in Seattle, and we're benefiting from now. Uh, I, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of this slide because it is so um, kind of insightful. Note the date, 2005. You know, people weren't talking about climate change and what that's going to do around here nearly as much, but he had some insight into what was going on. Today, um, I'm just going to lead it off for uh, Farron and um, in particular kind of take the marine side of the uh, heat waves there, um, revisit the, the blob. It's still fresh in our memory in a climate context. And then just take a couple of minutes here to talk about um, uh, kind of the state of 
seasonal predictions for the waters of the Pacific Northwest. And um, so anyway, here we go. In uh, the fall and winter of 2013-14, I, I was struck by the, a persistent ridge of higher than normal pressure that kind of set up shop off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, south of the Gulf of Alaska. And it waxed and waned and all that, but it was um, um, amazing in terms of its, uh, again, its persistence and magnitude, uh, blocking the usual parade of storms across the Northeast Pacific. At the same time, because of the lack of storms, the lack of winds, and uh, therefore heat being drawn out of, of the ocean uh, versus normal that time of year, and the lack of stirring of the upper ocean and bringing up colder water from below, some very uh, warm water developed well off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, um, there by February of 2014. This is, shows a map of the sea surface temperature anomalies um, for that time of year. I dug, it was uh, mentioned earlier, I dug deep into my vocabulary and used a term for it in discussions with the media and um, uh, fellow scientists never knew that it would, or planned that it would take off and so be it. Um, I guess they were worse legacies. Uh, one thing that maybe is a little apt about uh, the term though, is that it wasn't a static situation. Uh, and we'll go back in the slides there, but it turned out that, um, you know, early in its lifetime, it's uh, the warmest waters relative to normal were off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, and by, um, it lasted multiple years, and by early 2016, the warmest waters were more off the coast of Mexico and the uh, um, well, uh, the Western North America and less so offshore. And that's in part because the a different sort of atmospheric weather pattern set up. All right. Um, yeah, this is maybe a little bit cut off at the top here, but um, this is a slide I cannibalized from a colleague, uh, Toby Garfield with the Southwest Fishery Science Center, just um, pointing out all the things that happened that were associated with the blob in terms of there, there were uh, repercussions on the weather in the, the Western North America, but especially in the ecosystem with um, emaciated fur seals as shown in the uh, lower right and um, seabird die-offs, all kinds of ecosystem uh, repercussions. So one of the main things I wanna do today is uh, kind of, um, well, I, I talk about how, you know, these marine heat waves and the blob in particular, how that um, fits in the context of global warming. And one thing there that I think is not sufficiently recognized is how much the ocean is warming. And in particular of the excess heat due to the enhanced concentrations of greenhouse gases. Um, I am, the excess heat in the entire climate system, including the atmosphere, ocean, the cryosphere, the ocean has uh, soaked up over 90% of that extra heat, about a third of the extra carbon. But it is, um, the ocean is definitely changing in a big way. And that's um, illustrated also here, if you look at a box about a thousand kilometers inside off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, we have a, a decent um, idea of what the sea surface temperatures were like in that, um, in the Northeast Pacific, going back to the late 1800s. Here's a time series for that box and you see warm years and cold years and kind of warmer periods and colder periods. And then at the very end here, Whoa, check your socks. There's the, there's the blob there, unprecedented temperatures and kind of, kind of rather distressing some um, additional really warm temperatures we've had out there in 2019 and 2020. So there's um, uh, some folks that have uh, looked at um, the, the marine heat wave of 1416, the blob um, from 
uh, how that fits in with you know the global warming and so forth. And in particular, a group at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, John Walsh and company, focusing on the waters of the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea. We've shown here are time series for the Gulf of Alaska, SSTs on the left, and at the bottom, um, heat content on the right, just showing with, in this region, I hadn't seen heat like that in the past. A uh, companion study by Mike Jaycox and uh, collaborators for the California current system part of the Northeast Pacific, this kind of polygon area outlined in black, again, have sh showed that the, the blob was in that region was uh, in part so severe because of the background warming associated with the climate change. And that um, it, it would still would have been a marine heat wave, but just the temperatures wouldn't have been as, as high as they were. All right. Um, now, I, um, you know, I don't want to carry coals to Newcastle too much. And I, I imagine a lot of the folks on this, um, attending this seminar are familiar with some of the work that's gone out, gone, uh, been conducted by the fish ecology group at the Northwest Fishery Science Center, looking at the linkages between salmon returns and uh, environmental indices. And I bring up this, this stoplight type um, chart here produced by that group, just showing those years there in the 2015, especially 2016, how a lot of those um, different indicators for the physical system up in the uh, upper two groups are in the red category, poor, and indeed uh, the, the response at the, um, in the ecosystem, both the lower trophic levels and for the, the salmon was um, commensurate with that with um, really poor conditions for those guys. What's kind of interesting here, yeah, the environmental conditions, um, physical conditions also were rather poor here in 2019, didn't last long, but in 2022 also. But uh, for various reasons, um, presumably there's, um, uh, the ecosystem response was uh, not nearly as uh, severe as it was during the, the heyday of the blob. And so, um, we can take some, you know, comfort in that, I suppose. Um, again, at the risk of um, telling you something you already know quite well, uh, some of the work that has uh, been done by Julie Keister, working with um, Bill Peterson um, in the past and, uh, and others has, has shown that a real strong linkage between environmental conditions, especially off the, the coast of the Pacific Northwest and um, lower trophic levels. And in particular, the idea that when there's colder water out there, the boreal species that are large and lipid field, a lot more calories, there's a lot more of those guys versus the warm water species um, that might be a, a numerous, but they're just not very good eating for uh, juvenile salmon or some of the forage fish that some of the smaller salmon are uh, preying upon. And um, what, uh, what Julie has found, uh, along with others, is that uh, the existence of that cold water along the coast um, doesn't absolutely guarantee high uh, uh, salmon survival and uh, a large number of returning adults, but it seems to be a necessary condition. So when we have more of the boreal community, cold water, the larger uh, copepods, the cheeseburgers, rather than the warm water, subtropical copepods, the rice cakes, then um, that seems to be favorable to the salmon. All right, just a little bit more about uh, climate change. Um, by the way, you're welcome to look more into this. There's um, and the report from the IPCC that was put out, was it last? I think it was uh, the fall of 2020. This report weighs in at about 1,300 pages, so it's maybe not so appropriate for bedside reading. But um, you know, there's a lot of goodies in there. 
Um, one of the things that, of course, we're anticipating is continuation of warming of the oceans. And so here, uh, from the models that were used as part of the CMIP-5 group of climate models for projecting out in the future, looking at how temperatures are, uh, for those group of models as a whole, are expected to be in basically the early part of the 21st century versus the latter part of the 20th century, you know, warming, you know, stop the presses, especially in the Western North Pacific. Some fall, um, but that's not the only thing that's going on, of course. There are rises in sea level, changes in temperature, stratification, the altering nutrient supply, changes in the ocean chemistry and so forth. And so there's a lot going on and it's not like we have it all figured out yet by any means. Um, one of the um, uh, things that's uh, I think worth um, exploring and you know, kind of connecting uh, my talk with the one that's going to be following just in a few minutes is the idea of, you know, there are land-based heat waves like we had in the Pacific Northwest last summer, and then there are marine heat waves like the blob. And there's a, um, an important distinction between what we're anticipating there in, in future decades. And in particular, because of the, uh, the large amount of variability in air temperatures over land, a really wide distribution in temperatures, even with a very large um, increase in land temperatures, um, perhaps the, uh, in a relative sense, the number of heat waves not necessarily the most intense one, but the number of them, and maybe you know something like double or something like that, in that to reach the 95 or 99 percentile um, category or so, um, that, yeah, that'll happen more, but maybe not as much more as in the ocean, which has a much um, more restricted sort of variability in its temperatures and a smaller shift in that, um, in that probability density function, the PDF of those temperatures implies that what constitutes um, a marine heat wave with the historical, from a historical perspective is gonna be reached a lot more because of that shift and, uh, and uh, uh, in combination with a tighter distribution. So um, I, you know, I mentioned um, a few slides ago, you know, the idea of warming in the oceans. And uh, one thing, there's the deep ocean and there's more in the Salish Sea region. And if you direct your attention here to um, uh, expected changes in temperature in the Strait of Georgia, Strait of Juan de Fuca, Puget Sound, and so forth. Maybe this looks like good news in that um, we're anticipating actually maybe less warming, at least in sea surface temperatures um, here than uh, right along the coast. And that's a, uh, mostly because there's an estuarine circulation where the water that's coming into these inland waters comes in at depth and is replaced by water going out, the lighter, uh, fresher water that's less dense at top going out at the top. And the waters at depth aren't warming as fast as they are near the surface. So you might think, hey, that's good news for the Salish Sea. But then if you drill down and we're using some uh, high resolution ocean models, when you actually get right into the estuaries, then uh, again, maybe the central part of Puget Sound is going to be not as warm as right along the coast. But in the key habitats there represented by the estuaries, um, we're expecting them to warm up uh, quite markedly. Uh, all right, just a little bit more, and then again, I want to turn it over. Um, well, there is the real potential for some nasty surprises and so just some things that we don't really can't anticipate. That as we're mucking up the atmosphere ocean climate system, and the potential for new 
you know, combinations of climate variables like I'm putting here, shifts in storm tracks and so forth. We've already seen that, um, the potential for that happening where the variability in the um, pressure, uh, the Lucian low and other uh, major parts of the atmospheric circulation where they have set up in past decades where they're, versus where they're setting up now, that is, that is, has changed and conceivably there could be more of those that we're, we just don't know how that's gonna play out. The one thing we can be sure of, uh, despite this cartoon here from the American scientists 10 or more years ago, which, you know, the, the seas are going dead. The sun is still going to come up. Carbon's going to be fixed, and there's going to be a food chain. But there is liable to be reorganizations of that um, that food web. All right, last minute or two, I just uh, talk about prediction. And here, this slide um, that I got from Mana Di Lorenzo and others um, breaks all the rules about too many words on. on I'm not going to let you read it, but just the idea that um, there's an increasing interest and effort in trying to do seasonal ocean prediction, kind of like we do seasonal weather prediction, and involves interactions and um, collaboration between climatologists, oceanographers, uh, fishery oceanographers, and um, that in particular are by trying to make these seasonal forecasts, if nothing else, we can learn about how making longer term forecasts also. And moreover, these seasonal forecasts, if they're any good, could be really useful themselves. What we're finding in a uh, experimental forecast system that has been set up for the Pacific uh, coast is that we do have some skill. And in these, um, uh, uh, present effort here is going into looking at the conditions related to Dungeness crab along the coast, very important commercial fishery, of course. And we find these are kind of correlation maps of basically for a sea surface temperature on the left, bottom temperature in the middle and bottom oxygen concentrations on the right. Red colors mean where we do a better job of these seasonal forecasts and we actually do better at, um, at depth than we do at the surface. The atmosphere is noisy and produces a lot of variability. And there's actually more predictability in conditions at depth. And um, I think that's kind of an interesting result that's coming out of some of this work that's being done. Let's go back to the blob itself. In August of 2013, on the um, an ensemble of climate models suggested, woo, off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, it's going to be warmer than normal that for later that year going into the um, uh, early 2014. Magnitude a little less than a degree C, uh, warmer than usual. What actually happened was um, warm temperatures were forecast, uh, but something we, uh, we've seen in other places at other times also kind of under prediction of the magnitude. And so here the actual temperatures were more than two degrees above normal where the models as a group were, you know, something to half that at best. We do know that um, the El Nino, La Nina, the whole ENSO cycle is a source of predictability. And in particular, during El Nino, we tend to have warm waters along the coast of the Pacific Northwest in the winter. In La Nina is cooler water. We're in La Nina right now, and the present sea surface temperature anomalies look very much like what you see in the, um, the plot on the right. All right. So. I've taken up enough of your time. Just um, want to follow up just with the idea that um, you know the marine heat wave of 1416, the blob, uh, unprecedented. We are learning from how the uh, the sensitivities in the system from um, what the response was to that event, and um, we're going to have more of them. That's a pretty good bet, and so. Um, it is important to kind of uh, learn from them. And then uh, something that I'm particularly excited about is the idea that we have some predictability in forecasting ocean conditions out, maybe as long as a year or so, 
and maybe we can uh, use those to our benefit. And so I encourage you to sharpen up your pencils, get some questions ready, and I'm anxious to hear from Farron. And so I'm gonna escape my, stop my sharing and let's go. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for your insightful presentation. And I'm sure it's going to generate a lot of discussion and questions. And again, reminder to the audience to use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. And even if you don't have a question, have a look at the questions. They're going to be visible to everyone. Upvote your favorite questions, leave comments, add questions. And we're going to have our next speaker and then followed by a facilitated discussion and in-depth Q&A session led by, um, by uh, John Holmes of the COHO Technical Committee. Now, as we transition, so we have two speakers today. So Nick Bond concluded his presentation and our next presentation is going to be from Farron Anslow. So um, representing the both sides of the border as part of the seminar series. Farron is a, one of the lead climatologists with, he does climate analysis and monitoring as part of the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium at the University of Victoria. He holds a PhD from OSU, my alma mater, and in geology and atmospheric science. And his work involved real-time forecasting of the heat dome event in June, 2021. And a special call out for Farron today should be the fact that on Thursday of last week, he broke two of his ribs. So he's um, graciously agreed to present despite being injured. So we should be really thankful for that. Um, and I will turn it over to Farron for his presentation. And a reminder, folks, um, add your questions and specify who the speaker is that you'd like to answer the question. So Farron, are you available to share your screen? I am, thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Um, thanks for getting the rib breaking out of the way. I appreciate that. Um, I wish there was a better story and I wish we were in non-COVID times so I could tell the story over a uh, beer, um, but basically I crashed my bike in the snow. <laughs> so um, because of that, I wasn't able to, to do as much work on this presentation as I had hoped. So I'm gonna mostly talk about um, the detection and attribution work that we did um, with a group of scientists out of World Weather Attribution on the June heat wave. And I've tried to add in some uh, relevant dimensions to um, salmon in the Pacific coastal waters here. So I'll jump right into it here. Um, first of all, this is the attribution work was, was uh, I was part of a, a large group. I was lucky to get wrapped in with these, uh, the people at World Weather Attribution. Um, the authors are listed there. And you'll see a, a subtitle here. I'm, I'm not gonna get a chance to talk about it too much, but I'm happy to discuss it in the Q and A. Um, there's an interesting link between a uh, preceding atmospheric river um, that happened right before the heat wave event and atmospheric rivers seem to be the story of 2021 um, and now into 2022. I think we've already had a couple this year. So, so just a quick outline here, um, you know, what happened with the heat wave? Uh, what caused it? Um, was climate change involved? And then what can we say about the future? Um, and does this change our thinking um, about, about our future climate here? So first of all, just to look at the, um, some data from era five reanalysis. Re um, so era five goes from 1950 uh, and is up to date um, today. And this map is showing where records were set in the year 2021 for temperature. So this is the um, all time hottest temperature in the era five uh, record. And what you see is that the swath of heat was was quite large. It, it had big impacts in Oregon and Washington, but it really covered almost the entirety of British Columbia uh, from the coastal waters all the way out into northern Alberta and um, northern Saskatchewan. So a really um, a massive event um, affecting you know, both coastal watersheds, but also inland watersheds that, that drain to the, to the Pacific. In terms of the temperatures that were observed in British Columbia, um, what I've mapped here 
are on the left hand side where record setting uh, daily maximum temperatures were and on the right side where record setting warm overnight temperatures were. Um, and you know, scaled by the size of the record break. Um, so the larger the dot, the bigger the record break. Um, and right in the lower center of the left-hand panel, uh, the town Lytton uh, set a new temperature record for Canada wide, uh, almost hit 50 degrees centigrade. Uh, so up above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, um, I believe. Uh, but again, the overnight temperatures were also quite high. Um, so throughout BC, records were set. Um, and this, you know, here I'm just looking at, at British Columbia data, but um, similar picture and similar story could be told for uh, locations south of the border as well. And not captured, captured here is that, you know, this is a multi-day event. So records were broken successive days uh, for, you know, three days in a row. Um, so not only was it hot, it was continually hot um leading to a lot of pressure on our environment and our the humans that occupy the environment among others just a quick look at some of the impacts um photos from the event and the upper left that's a street in portland oregon that um, saw some concrete buckling uh, because of the thermal expansion of the the concrete a uh, huge marine die-off um i think this will be a really uh, maybe sad and, and scientifically interesting thing to look at as, as this plays out uh, throughout the rest of this year and into future years. Um, but the event coincided with extremely low and high tides and the peak heat uh, occurred right at uh, the lowest tide in the Salish Sea. And so there's a lot of marine life um, that was exposed. Um, you know, I don't think salmon are, are big on eating mussels, but there are a lot of things that are and, um, and that will have probably interesting links up into the food chains. Um, you know, the, the estimates of numbers of critters that died is up into the billions. I, I don't even know if you can actually put a good estimate on that number, but it was, it was huge. A uh, sad story of uh, Lytton, um, so the town that set the, the new temperature record uh, soon thereafter burned to the ground. Um, unfortunately, a, a small fire started um, right at about the time that the what would normally be a marine air push um, pushed up the Fraser Valley with, with high winds. Um, there's still a lot of residual heat and it fan flames that, that took out the town. On the lower right is the smoke plume from that from Modus imagery. So yeah, really destructive event from a human and ecological perspectives, agricultural culture as well. Um, save that for another talk. Uh, but you know, it was it was hot during the event, but it it remained hot throughout the summer. Um, so what I've got mapped here are uh, broken up by. Um, kind of the larger, some of the larger watersheds. Uh, the rankings of the average daily maximum temperature uh, throughout summer on the left-hand side, and then the rankings of the average uh, daily minimum temperature on the right-hand side. And er areas with a one are places where um, in the 1900 to present uh, record, um, new records were set. So really hot. Uh, from a Tmax perspective all the way through summer um, and extremely hot uh, from a Tmin perspective as well. Um, and this is, that's been an ongoing story with, uh, with quite, a lot, quite a few locations around the globe. Um, uh, Tmin's, basically the, the range between Tmax and Tmin has been shrinking as time goes on uh, with warmer and warmer overnight temperatures. Um, and you can do some of the modeling in your head on how that would affect stream temperatures when you're, you know, those areas are unable to cool quite as much at night as they otherwise would uh, in a cooler environment. And it was also quite dry. So similar map for summer precipitation. Um, here, the larger numbers represent the, the driest in the, the long-term record. Um, so not, not record setting by any stretch. Um, precipitation came back a fair bit towards the end of summer. 
uh, preventing the records from being set, but um, but really dry in the top top 20 driest um, summers that we've seen in British Columbia, at least for the southern half. And that led to um, pretty severe drought uh, throughout uh, many of the watersheds in British Columbia. So this is our uh, BC River Forecast Center drought classification where uh, five is the, the most extreme um, drought. And a lot of these areas, the drought starts to kick in uh, immediately after the heat wave and continues through the summer. Um, for some of the West Coast areas uh, like Vancouver Island, um, there were some regions um, like East, East Vancouver Island that were already approaching uh, drought conditions. It was, it was quite dry in the spring preceding the heat wave. And then the heat wave kind of kicked off the, the successive drying that occurred. And a quick look at um, just how the year played out um, in terms of the, the annual hydrograph, hydrographs, excuse me. Uh, so we're, what I'm showing here is the, the black line represents uh, the stream flow, seven day average stream flow that was observed for year 2021. And then the colors represent the, the historical percentile ranges um, from the historical record. And uh, so the first one we're looking at here is the Squamish River, uh, just up, upstream from Squamish Town site. So this is a stream that drains into Howe Sound and right into Georgia Strait and the Salish Sea. And we see a, a pretty low flow regime in the spring. Um, leading to the heat wave event, uh, which caused really high melting um, of the remaining snowpack and the glaciers in this basin. It's a pretty heavily glaciated uh, river basin. And that actually set uh, new records for early July stream flow. And then immediately following that, the, the discharge plummeted right down to record low levels. So, um, the reason I'm, I'm highlighting this is this, this is kind of a perfect type example of, of what we're expecting with, with climate change for a lot of basins in British Columbia. Um, for locations that are gonna retain their snow, um, so higher elevations that will be um, a bit uh, more slow to respond to warming temperatures. Um, we'll see, you know, close to normal snow packs in, in many years, but the switch from the, the wintertime snow regime uh, through the freshet is gonna be uh, likely much more um, abrupt and rapid than it uh, has been historically. And, and we see that here. Uh, likewise, um, this is the Chilliwack River, a um, bit less exciting, although we do see um, this river scraping down into the um, kind of the low flow regime by the end of the summer, setting low flow records. And then moving up the coast, um, I'll just flip through these. These are some of the bigger drainages um, leading into the BC coastal waters. Again, the Hamathco, uh, so this is kind of BC central coast, uh, set a new discharge record at about the same time, immediately after the heat wave, and, um, and then immediately plumbing, plummeting down to extremely low flows. Um, by early August. A uh, similar story for another river, the Nass, a little bit more normal there. And up in the Stikin, um, a similar event there with uh, record setting high flows during the event, and then a very rapid fall down to um, below median flows into the lower percentiles. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this. So, Kind of, I've got a, a little bit mixed up here talking about the heat wave itself and, and some of the uh, impacts. Um, but now I'm going to jump back into the heat wave and talk a bit about uh, just why we think it happened uh, to begin with. Uh, here's a um, satellite image uh, in the visual or in the visible bands, uh, just showing a, a distinct lack of clouds over North America. So you know, really clear skies. Um, there was no or very little wildfire smoke at this time. 
um, and right around the um, the solstice. And so it's the period with the longest days of the year, lots of opportunity for solar heating uh, to occur. It was quite dry. Um, so in Southern BC, um, this is a similar map to what I showed before with the, uh, in this case, looking at spring precipitation and we see record setting or near record setting dry conditions uh, throughout the Southern part of British Columbia. And that extended down into um, the Western Washington and, and a bit into Oregon as well. So uh, in conditions with uh, really dry soils, uh, there isn't uh, water available to, um, uh, to provide latent cooling. Um, so basically cooling from evaporation and, and when that's not available, the air temperatures uh, heat up much more quickly. Uh, the atmospheric pressure was was very high in terms of um, the so-called 500 millibar uh, geopotential levels. Uh, what I've got here, or what I'm showing here, are the the time series of 500 peak, 500 millibar heights uh, for a region uh, over uh, where the heat wave was, so 120 west, 50 north. Um, you see two things here. Um, you see a steady increase of the 500 millibar height, and that's basically a signal of, of climate change as, as the atmosphere warms, it, it thickens and that pushes the 500 millibar level up. Um, but we also see a, a new record being set. So, you know, a couple of peaks in the late 80s um, and uh, early 2000s, and then this event comes along and, and crushes the old record. And for comparison is a, a, a 500 millibar heights for a similar location or for a similar latitude in Europe um, where a heat wave hit in 2019, uh, also showing that you know, these high geopotentials were present. And what that implies is um, you know, under a, a ridge of high pressure like this, you have um, atmospheric subsidence and that subsidence leads to uh, compressional heating, um, and that helps promote these really high temperatures. And that's something um, that we're still kind of teasing out, but uh, we've seen that um, with previous heat waves in the region, uh, we tend to see higher than normal amounts of water vapor in the atmosphere. Um, part of that you might expect uh, just because warmer air is able to hold more moisture. So for a given relative humidity, um, the higher temperature air is gonna have more moisture in it. But preceding this event, there was a, a really strong atmospheric river. Um, so these plumes of tropical moisture that, that impact the West Coast or uh, here, um, they impact many coasts around the world. But in this case, um, that water vapor um, was pushed up against and over Southeast Alaska, and then it kind of got trapped under the, um, what was, uh, became called the, the heat dome. And the satellite image just kind of shows that process. Um, see the atmospheric river strike Southeast Alaska. Um, and then those gray shades indicating relatively high water vapor content just kind of swirl around toilet bowl like um, over British Columbia and and um, uh, Washington, and that just adds a little bit of a local enhanced greenhouse effect. Um, and it's it's possible that that was one of the factors that helped exacerbate the heat wave itself. Oops, trying to get out of this. So was it climate change? Um, or better phrased, um, was climate change a contributing factor? Uh, to answer that question, uh, we first have to define the event. And so in this case, we, uh, by we, I mean the group with world weather attribution. Um, we look at a, a single variable, um, look at a, a relatively restricted region. Um, and in this case, you know, we tried to overlap where, where a bulk of the pop population in the area and where the bulk of the impacts uh, happened. 
Um, first of all, we look at the instrumental data. And so what I'm showing here in the top left is the record of the highest temperatures for every year um, for this particular station. And, and this is actually a, a joined station um, from two communities near Vancouver, um, a bit outside the urban heat island. And what we see is the, the annual hottest temperature. It kind of varies around, you know, values around 33, 34 degrees. And then we get this big um, step change with the heat wave, um, with the new record being set around 41 degrees. And if we take those data and we um, fit extreme value distribution to that data, um, it tells us you know, more or less what the expected return period of the event is based on, on that historical record. And we can also derive how much more likely the event was um, with the amount of global warming that we've seen uh, since the pre-industrial period. And so for this particular station, um, we saw a record break of four degrees. Um, we had to we had to really <laughs> we had to work hard to to get you know, even a defined return period of of one in a thousand years. Um, the initial estimates that we were getting were um, essentially that the event was was not possible. Um, but when we adjusted the methodology to include the event um, in the definition of the extreme value fit, um, we were able to to get a defined return period. But but that that should be taken as you know a thousand or more years as a return period based on the statistics. Um, Relative to pre-industrial, um, the amount of warming that we've seen has made this event uh, about 170 times more likely. And it, the amount of warming that we've seen has led to this, you know, an event of this rarity being 3.4 degrees warmer than it would have been in the past. Oops. Uh, similar results uh, for Lytton. This wasn't in the paper that, that we, um, have submitted now on this work, um, but just some analysis that I did. Uh, similar story, you see temperatures in the uh, hottest day of the year uh, through time kind of hovering around, you know, 39, 40 degrees. And then this massive record break, um, bringing it all the way up to approaching 50 degrees. Um, that record break is five degrees in size there at at Lytton with a very, very long uh, return period. And the amount of climate change that we've seen has made this type of event, you know, much more likely, um, you know, given, given this data and its variability. And then we can then um, look at global climate models and climate projections and perform a, a similar analysis um, to compare um, what are called the risk ratios that basically tell us how much more likely with additional uh, anthropogenic warming an event like this becomes. Um, so as we, you know, in this case, we took a two degree climate, or a two degree warmer climate as the benchmark. Um, so 0.9 degrees warmer than now. And Based on that model data, uh, we see this event becoming something more like a one in five or a one in 10 year event. Um, so with climate change, something like this um, is likely to happen much more frequently. Uh, what does it tell us about our, our future and does it change our thinking? Um, and we know with great certainty that this event was, was a result of a very rare set of circumstances. Um, no matter how you slice it, a lot of things had to come together um, exactly right to give us these kind of temperatures in this, this climate. And given that, this event would be very unlikely to happen again um, if we weren't in a climate change regime. So our, our climate statistics are not stationary. Um, so these events become more and more likely as each successive year passes. Um, so with climate change, it's, it's very likely to, again to happen before the end of the century. And there, there may need to be changes in the way that we look at um, how we assess heat waves um, 
you know, maybe looking at some of the processes that lead to the hottest temperatures. I'm going to skip over that slide. Uh, this is a paper that came out. Um, it was in review, um, or I guess it it was published shortly after the the June heat wave. So it must have been in review or just finishing being reviewed right about the time the heat wave happened. Um, but these authors were looking at um, these giant leaps um, in in temperature, these these huge record breaks. Um, and what they found is that um, using climate model data, it's actually to be expected um, that we see these these huge step changes um, in in large temperature anomalies uh, like heat waves. So in this case, this is the the TX seven day, so the um, the extreme seven day average temperature in this case, uh, just for a sample point um, from a model in the central part of the United States. And it shows similar to what we see in the data from the heat wave that we observed. Um, you know, the record kind of hovers about a median value and then an event comes along and just, just shatters the record. And the reason for this is, is when you, when you're looking at these events, you have to look at the, the non-stationary um, statistics um, of the records that you're looking at. Um, so here the, you know, the purplish and the teal color, the, the stationary uh, return levels, but in a changing climate, you really have to look at um, return levels that are ascending in time. And what happens is that the variability in the record um, has a potential for, for masking the amount of warming that has occurred um, until you have that unlucky year. And then all of a sudden, you know, you jump, jump beyond or to that uh, level of, of non-stationary statistics that are actually, actually present in the underlying process, um, but that we just haven't realized because our climate hasn't sampled them yet. Um, I think I'm about out of time. Is that, is that right? <laughs> You've got a few minutes to wrap up. Okay. Um, yeah, so the conclusions from the heat wave, um, you know, record shattering heat. I think everybody on this, uh, this seminar experienced it personally and has probably now seen it in the field as well. Um, you know, it was a combination of factors uh, that had to come together to help produce uh, this kind of heat. So high pressure, clear skies, uh, the summer solstice, uh, water vapor, a uh, variety of things, uh, dry antecedent conditions. Um, climate change made this event more likely than it would have been. Um, you know, I think based on the, the observation and the models, um, we have, have a pretty robust conclusion there. Um, and it's, I think it is a preview of events that will happen in our future. Um, yeah, um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I think this is something that we're going to see a few times in our lifetime. Um, and the, the climate models uh, agree with that standpoint. Yeah, I'll leave it there. All right, thank you, Farron. And a reminder to folks, so I have um, 1256. So we are going to take a break until approximately 1.05. Uh, just stretch, grab a drink, and also look at the Q&A function in or box at the bottom of your screen and enter your questions for Farron or Nick. And we will reconvene at 1.05 promptly, and we will have a facilitated Q&A and discussion session with both of our speakers. Um, about any of the issues related to their talks, environmental variation and salmon management. So um, see you all in about eight minutes. Welcome back everybody. And thank you, Nick and Farron for hanging out with us as we collect our thoughts and, and, and questions. So John Holmes, are you available? I am indeed, hello everyone. 
so let's just get started here. I'm going to quickly share my screen with some softball questions here. And, and these questions could be uh, uh, for either of our speakers today, because I think they equally apply to marine heat waves and heat domes. Um, first one is, I'll go through them all, and because uh, I think in, in some cases, some answers have been provided during the talks, but in other cases, maybe there's a bit more detail to be had. Um, uh, climate change is characterized by extreme fluctuations and weather events. For example, extreme heat wave events leading to drought and extreme atmospheric river events leading to flooding. Is the magnitude and frequency of these events expected to increase? A second question relates to uh, what time frame does uncertainty begin to matter with climate forecasts? Is it a year, five years, 10 years, 100 years, something longer? Um, third question is, were the heat waves in 2014 to 16, the, the blob or the first blob and 2019, 2020, blob two, uh, formed the same way? such as largely lack of uh, mixing or were their origins fundamentally different? And is there something to be learned from that? And then the, the, the fourth question here is what information monitoring systems exists that can provide advanced warning of extreme events? What advice can you provide about how to determine this significance of extreme events for salmon? So, um, those are sort of four uh, 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 lead off questions uh, and and uh, looking for any uh, input advice comment from our speakers. I have thought, uh, oh, go ahead, Nick. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say uh, the first one, uh, you know, there are uh, all these are very insightful and those uh, that were entered in the Q&A. And I'm going to defer to um, my colleague, you know, the number one here, extreme fluctuations in weather. He was just talking about those. And so, you know, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I can jump in on number one. Um, yeah. So I think um, one way to, to characterize this is looking at, at what we call the probability distribution. Um, so Nick showed us a slide of that just kind of the expectation of, of average and extreme temperatures. And so the way to characterize this question in terms of the probability distribution is, so the magnitude would mean that the whole distribution shifts to, to higher temperatures, um, if we're talking about temperature or more rainfall, if we're talking about rainfall. And then the, the frequency of extremes um, refers to, kind of how the shape of the tail of the curve. So as you get out to the, the far end of the curve, um, does that thicken in time or become more thin? And so we know with, with great certainty that um, the curve is gonna shift to warmer temperatures. Um, so that's pretty well, well established. Um, for precipitation on land, um, you know, we. The general consensus is that that there's going to be a bit more precipitation over BC. Um, I think that in winter time, especially, and I, I think that applies um, south of the border as well. But in terms of the shape of the tail, um, so for temperature, there's some evidence, um, and this is looking at it from a global perspective, that that the most ex the most extreme events are happening a bit less frequently. And so the, the tail is potentially thinning a little bit with, with the most extreme events. Um, in the analysis that we did, we, we fit um, curves to the distribution from the models. Um, and so our analysis would have taken into account uh, that effect to the extent that um, it's captured in the models. Um, but just looking at the observational data, there's a little bit of a hint that the, the hottest end of the extreme value distributions is, is not filling out as quickly as the, the middle part of the extreme value distributions, if that makes sense. So the magnitude yeah. will shift for sure. The frequency um, may, not, may not be a direct shift. 
Yeah, I, I agree totally with that. And I think we have to be a little humble about how much we can really say about that because talking about, of course, um, extreme events that by definition don't happen very often, the statistics are small numbers and consistent with that in uh, tropical cyclones. They, in the observations, there aren't any more of them, but just more of them are getting to the intense kind of um, levels. And so that's consistent with that. Um, but again, we're, um, we have to be a little bit careful because, yes. um, you know, we don't know as much as we think we know. And I'd, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't, didn't indicate that there's, there's really important, especially when you're looking at these coastal, um, there are heat waves like this on, on the coastal regions where you have this interplay between uh, hot continental air and, and marine air. Um, so the GCMs don't capture that interface uh, very well, or if at all. <laughs> um, and some, some regional modeling um, out of UW uh, by, by some of Nick's colleagues has shown that, you know, there's some chance that on the, on the coastal margin uh, changes in um, where the surface high and low pressure centers set up um, may actually reduce uh, the frequency of, of extreme temperature occurrence. But that really applies to the, the coastal margin. Um, this large scale heat wave that we saw um, in June, you know, splayed far beyond um, just that coastal area, but they're really important um, regional effects that have to be, have to be taken account of when you're, you're talking about this. Okay, thanks for that. Any thoughts about the time frame for uncertainty and, and what matters from a climate forecasting standpoint? Yeah, I'd like to um, briefly touch on that. And uh, while it may sound um, kind of silly or, um, you know, no, not a lot of logic behind it, I, I'm in some ways more comfortable about a 50 year forecast than a five year forecast. And it turns out there's um, multi-year variability in the weather in the period about 2010 to 2013 or so, people were grousing about how cold it was in the Pacific Northwest and so forth. And so the, uh, these kind of, um, those variations in the climate are gonna continue and um, they might, um, who knows if we're getting into a cold period um, starting you know, this summer, uh, that may mute the effects of climate change. But uh, overall, the, um, the increase in uh, greenhouse gas concentration and so forth and the warming is inexorable. And so in some ways, depending on kind of the, what you're looking at, we're more sure it's really going to be warm 50 years from now than we are five years from now. And um, uh, that being said, uh, certainly, when we're talking about the longer time scales, what we do as a global society makes a really big difference. Uh, how much we the fossil fuels we burn in the next year won't matter to the temperatures in the next year, but how many uh, you know what we do as as a globe over the next couple of decades is certainly going to um, relate to what conditions are like at the end of the century. Okay, thanks for that. So what I thought I'd do now is 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 go to the questions that are in the, the question and answer uh, box, and we'll circle back to these yep. uh, on the screen if there's still time at the end. So first one of the most uh, upvoted question comes from uh, Marilyn Scanlon, and and it and it goes like this: Some salmon stocks are doing okay and made it through the blob. The, uh, compared to other stocks that are, are doing terrible. Is it possible that there are some new good food opportunities emerging other than the historical food chain relationship to copepods that these successful stocks are benefiting from? That is, can they can salmon benefit and adapt to a reorganization of the food web that may be occurring with, with some of these heat waves and, and uh and whatnot, and and so one example here, maybe if we if if more squid are moving north, can they adapt and take advantage of them? So I think this is a question for you, Nick. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, a very insightful one, and uh, that's definitely true. You know, some stocks have 
I have done a lot better than other ones. And it isn't, um, um, yeah. And, uh, you know, different stocks have different life histories and uh, uh, the individuals that are part of them have different strategies. During many of the blob summers, the upwelling right along the coast was pretty um, substantial. And so the, um, those individuals that maybe stuck to right to the coastal zone had better um, prey fields than those that were just predisposed to go elsewhere. And um, so there's, um, and that makes sense. The salmon have been around for a long, long time and have undergone swings in the climate. And to have a diversified portfolio is the way that you survive as a species. And so we're seeing some of that um, in these kind of a, a, a events. And it is, um, getting back to the point I said before, I don't understand why, you know, necessarily ones did better than others. Certainly generalists tend to do better than more specific ones that have really specific dietary needs. But um, I think there is a real opportunity here to, from the past and marine heat waves that are coming up to learn which ones are um, you know, more resilient, which aren't and why. And so there are some opportunities here in the near term that we can use so we can just better manage things in the future. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, the next question is from Dan Auerbach, uh, the second most popular one. Do, and I think this is actually for, for either one of you. Do the regional seasonal scale forecasting efforts include both mechanistic and probabilistic approaches? Curious about the scope to examine conditions outside the range of historical observations. I can talk about the atmospheric end, but yep. if, if I should. Sure. Um, yeah, um, so they, they do include both, um, both um, statistical models uh, based on, on observations and, and data from the past, as well as, um, you know, deterministic uh, runs of seasonal forecast models. So essentially very similar to, to weather models. And then some kind of hybrid approaches looking at um, some of the specific drivers of our, our weather var variability around here, uh, namely and so and um, and I think also important is is the Madden Julian oscillation for that subseasonal um, scale. So it, um, it's a combination, um, and I would let's, yeah I would I would I would hope that the deterministic models are able to to adapt um, to be able to to simulate um, or project or forecast into the future outside of uh, what the historical odds say. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's what I have to say on that. Yeah, okay. on, the, on the ocean side, I think, uh, you know, the seasonal forecasts are still pretty primitive. The SST forecasts are made, but things like ocean, subsurface ocean conditions, we're just starting to scratch the surface, pun intended there. Um, and uh, I, I, I think there's some hope for some of the new machine learning approaches and so forth. Even in the atmosphere, that's starting to be done. And the, the beauty of those approaches is that you can do a lot more model runs and really get um, uh, a full suite of model, uh, uh, an ensemble, large ensemble of model runs to kind of, you know, get some statistics and uh, probabilities of conditions of one way or another. And, um, and then finally, I want to circle back to a point that Farron made in his presentation about the importance of the uh, dry conditions in the spring in the Pacific Northwest and our heat wave. There's been a lot of um, work that's gone on that especially having to do with heat waves in Europe that have shown that um, on scales of months, uh, precipitation, a drought can set the stage, it doesn't guarantee, but it makes it more likely that you have a, um, that much more of an extreme heat wave. And so maybe we can use some of that information in a more um, 
sort of uh, uh, predictability um, to uh, add to our predictability of what's happening. We won't be able to time an event and you know guarantee it, but just say what the odds are like. And um, so I, I think it's a, the overall idea there of getting better predictions. It's really important, I think, for us to do it because we can learn from our mistakes. We have to wait 50 years to see if our climate models are right or not. You know, I'm going to be um, no longer around at that point. And, but, you know, seasonal forecast, I have a fighting chance of being and seeing how, you know, the summer's going to turn out. Uh, and, and so um, I think we can really learn a lot by, you know, doing that sort of thing and can actually gain some useful information. Yeah, I'll, I'll add in there. Um, that's a good point about the, the dry conditions leading to the heat wave. It's in a sense, it's almost like that provides an opportunity for a heat wave watch to be put out or something like that. Um, you know, a watch in meteorology means the conditions are present for a thing to happen, but, you know, it's not happening just yet. And I think dry conditions are, are one source of that kind of predictability. Um, another one having to do with um, the heat wave that we saw and also um, some of the recent weather events, including the, the cold snap, uh, goes back to the conditions in the tropics and the MJO. Um, so the Mandelian oscillation is is... Basically, this effect in the tropics where the location of, of convection kind of moves along the equator in a somewhat predictable fashion. Um, and the location of a convection really determines where our high and low pressure ridges set up um, over us. And I was <laughs> watching on Twitter of all places, um, some MJO experts uh, looking ahead um, during the like before the cold snap uh, even really set in and, and looking at how the MJO is going to evolve and, and making really good pro projections on where the temperatures were going to be coldest and, and warmest. And so I think that'd be another source of that, that sub-seasonal predictability is, is looking at what the, the tropics are doing and, and how that can impact uh, where the high pressures are going to set up and lead to heat waves um, or blobs in the case of um, although over to your time scales, the MGO is probably a, not, not the dominant player there. Okay, thanks for that. I can see Marissa on the screen, which means we're probably close to the end of our time here. <laughs> now we, have, uh, we have about five more minutes for questions and we still have a number of questions in the Q&A box. Yeah. Huh? Yep, that's where I was going. Uh, I, I've shut down my sheen, screen share and video just because I was getting those messages about unstable internet connection. So uh, hopefully it's stable now. Uh, so the next one is, is for uh, either of you. It's from Gary Marishima. There is a time lag between the occurrence of an event and how it may affect uh, ecological or biological processes that impact salmon. For example, disruption of food webs impacting the growth and survival of juvenile salmon entering the ocean. Is there any information on developments of attribution science? Well, I'm not so sure about attribution science, but I know NOAA is interested in trying to, um, well, uh, better monitor the conditions that are associated with or preceding things like marine heat waves. And so that is, um, um, I only have uh, superficial knowledge of where they're along in that, uh, in that process, but it, um, you know, folks like that are on this call, the input from you about some of the things that you know about that seem to be the early indicators. I'd like to know about them so that we can make recommendations. Hey, we got to monitor that. It's not enough to go out of the Newport line only, <laughs> but there's, you know, maybe other parts of the ocean system that we should be looking at and maybe, um, uh, there's other parts of the freshwater habitat, you know, that uh, we should be monitoring better to kind of anticipate some of these events uh, and uh, be less likely to be caught with it, 
egg on our shorts to mix a metaphor. And Farah and I, I'm not sure if you have anything to add or subtract from that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons salmon are so interesting is they're they're fairly they sample all <laughs> a wide variety of time scales. Um, so the you know the returning salmon. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of of one particular inlet here in BC where in certain summers the salmon go up the inlet and they if the temperatures are at a certain threshold they don't have sufficient oxygen and they're they're stuck uh, in at in the deep water and can't really migrate as effectively and, and they kind of waste right. away. Um, so that's kind of a short time scale, like they're responding to the, the immediate effects. Um, and then, yeah, they're, you know, they're also responding to the, how, you know, ocean and, and atmospheric variability affects their food supplies. So yeah, it's not a very good answer other than to say that it's, it's, it's all, <laughs> all time scales, I think. And I think it's important to, and uh, we both touched on this, is if we're, even if we're not exactly sure there's going to be a heat wave of unprecedented magnitude coming on, you know, this date on the calendar, if we know that the odds are different than usual, rather lower or higher, that is um, information that is actionable, I would say. And uh, again, in the terrestrial or marine environment. And so um, I think there's, maybe some reluctance among communities, uh, oh, just tell us what's gonna happen then. But then we're dealing with probabilistic type information. And um, I think we can make better use of what we actually even um, have at hand right now. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks for participating and being so free and open with your responses. And I think it's over to you, Marissa, to uh, to close this out. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, John. So uh, you know, I, I really would like to take the time to thank both of our speakers and ask of them one um, last favor, if they would. And this is uh, based on a question that came from Gary Morishima that, that really was not posted in the Q&A. But in, in a minute or less, could each of you um, answer the following question? So what advice can you provide about how to determine the significance of extreme events for salmon in the long term? So short answer, and then we'll wrap up. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so the, the significance of extreme events, certainly um, we've seen that these extreme events can uh, devastate a year class. And so they can, they can have meaningful impacts on, uh, you know, um, populations and so forth. And um, uh, again, I come back to the learning opportunity and the uh, differences between various stocks, not, uh, different species, but even the stocks within the species to kind of um, um, be able to figure out just what really counts um, for these guys. And uh, ultimately, um, how we can better and anticipate what's gonna happen and manage them more effectively. Thank you, Nick and, and Farron. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> um, yeah, not being a, a salmon expert, I have a, I have a hard time uh, answering that one really well. Um, but I, yeah, I think it's um, yeah, under, understanding understanding the stocks, how they how they respond to various conditions. Um, uh, one thing one thing I didn't mention and it and hasn't been mentioned is you know there's there's food supplies but there's also um, parasitic issues that salmon face and that's that's another big player um and so i think just looking at looking at all the factors that that uh affect salmon and and comparing the time scales that drive those factors to the the extreme events that we may see coming down the pipe yeah and i just if i could add just briefly to that that uh, one size does not fit all our uh different streams especially have much different seasonal hydrographs 
uh, we're anticipating different changes in those hydrographs depending on where you are, whether you know the roots or the you know the watersheds are in the Canadian Rockies versus the coastal Oregon or something. And so it's really hard to make any generalizations. And um, I'm actually guardedly optimistic that if we can um, continue to have wild fish with some genetic diversity, there's gonna be individuals there that are better suited for the future climate and um, the salmon are not gonna go extinct. And so I think that's maybe a place to end. <laughs> that's a great place to end. So thank you both so much. Uh, I wish we could have you on for another hour to talk more about climate and extreme events, but appreciate your time. Thank you to our audience for your, uh, we, you know, sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but um, stay tuned because the Pacific Salmon Commission will be hosting a series of workshops throughout um, 2022 and more opportunity to stay engaged. So um, to, all the presenters today and the audience, thank you very much. Oh, and feel free to share the, the slides that I have if uh, people want them and to get back to me. I'm easy to find. Yeah, all right. That's yeah, like, likewise here. And um, I copied some of the questions from the Q&A and, &A and I, can, I can type up some of my answers. Um, maybe Nick can do the same and we can send them to you and you can distribute them as you see fit. That would be great, wonderful. All right. Well, thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thanks for having me. Take care, everybody.